I V M. We would like to thank Storytel for sponsoring this show. Storytel is an audiobook platform that lets you hear hundreds of thousands of stories on your mobile PC wherever you prefer. Generally, Storytel is a great deal at 299 rupees a month, but that's not good enough for IVM listeners. We want something more. So for our listeners, if you go to storytel.com slash IVM, you can get your first month for just 99 bucks. That's 200 bucks off. That's a crazy deal. Go take advantage. This week, I'm going to recommend a modern classic, something that many of you have seen, many of you have heard of, but few have read or listened to. That's Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin. The entire series is available on Storytel. The story is based loosely on the War of the Roses succession fight that happened in 15th century England. And when you hear Roy Dotris, the narrator, really bring this out, his voice tonality is so on point for the kind of historical tone that they're trying to strike, you'd really lose yourself in it. So do definitely check that out at storytell.com slash IVM and go get the Game of Thrones book. You'll enjoy it. That's storytell.com slash IVM. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, and welcome to All Things Policy. A lot of us might be familiar with terms like the G7 or the G2 or the G4 or the G8. Um, and we we might increasingly also be familiar with a grouping such as the Quad, which is uh, a security dialogue between uh, the US, Australia, Japan um, and, the, and India. Um, but there are new kinds of alignments that are emerging in the world today, um, which have a totally different agenda than security um, and just broad economic collaboration. And these are coalitions based around technology. Uh, so you have groupings uh, like the T10, the T12 and so on that are being talked about. Um, what we're going to do over the course of this podcast is try to understand what the potential is for technology groupings, um, what these groupings aim to achieve and where India's stance might be as far as these technology groupings are and how these might actually end up serving the national interest. So welcome Rohan and Pranay. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. So let's begin by starting to understand what a technology collaboration is. Um, Ron, tell you, can you tell us a little bit about these T12s and other groupings that are being talked about today? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I want to start by plugging in an op-ed that Pranay and I wrote for Hindustan Times. I think it's a cardinal rule at, at Takshashila or specifically my podcast that I do something. So when we, when we were writing this op-ed, we... We started by saying T12 is the new G8 and so on. So it, it, it some, seemed like a bit of an alphabet soup to me. Uh, but if you if you basically go into these alliances, T12, T10, D10 and so on, the basic idea is that a bunch of democracies uh, get together to counter the rise of China in technology. So for example, um, I mean, I think we can put the readings in the show notes. But um, so for example, eight countries recently formed an alliance to counter China as far as 5G was concerned. Right. And so um, those eight countries are US, Germany, UK, Japan, Australia, Canada, Sweden, Norway, and members of the European Parliament. And that's a pretty significant uh, cross section of democracies that, that want to counter China on 5G. Uh, there's also this thing called um, um, a clean network initiative, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Mike Pompeo uh, said that in a press release. I think Manoj referred me to that. That, that specifically, taught, the whole page basically talks about having a bunch of democracies follow a certain uh, standard for critical industries like semiconductors for 5G for uh, for data that is opposed to the Chinese standard and they're pretty vocal about suppressing the rise of, rise of China in technology. So so all of this clean water clean network initiative T10 uh, T12 uh, D10 are basically initiatives that want to define a new standard of technology that democracies generally are comfortable with and uh, that is opposed to how China uh, approaches tech and policy. Okay, so th- that's a, that's something that I want to kind of like quiz you about a little bit, Rohan, because I find it interesting that you say that the reason why these, co- these countries are coming together is because they're uh, democracies. So it is the idea that China and Chinese technology is somehow such a terrible threat to their values uh, that they are banding up together to stop that. Uh, because, I mean, to be per- let's be perfectly frank. I mean, the U.S. doesn't exactly have the best record uh, when it comes to respecting the priv- uh, data privacy. Um, and so I find it a little odd that we, we say that these are democracies 
democracies that are coming together because I, I think personally that you could also interpret as a kind of um, national interest driven calculation to kind of help uh, Western technology firms uh, compete with uh, Chinese firms, which tend to have uh, much, much cheaper products uh, on a more even footing. What do you think? I would argue that um, there is some truth to uh, two statements. The first one is that there is some element of national interest uh, involved in countering China because they don't want to compete with the Chinese uh, on some fronts. Uh, and the other sort of, I don't know, um, darker point is that there is some concern around the areas that the Chinese are targeting as far as tech is concerned. So there are genuine concerns about um, Huawei installing 5G networks in your country, for example. Uh, and there are also genuine concerns around the Chinese, uh, I think they, they said it themselves, Chinese want to be self-reliant as far as uh, semiconductors are concerned. So um, both of these uh, 5G and semiconductors are pretty foundation technologies um, that will basically form the highways on which the rest of your tech is built. And if, if someone else is um, is building those highways for you, then that is a strategic um, a strategic thing that you need to consider and and basically try to avoid. So little column A, little column B to that. Yeah, uh, if I may just add to that, I agree with Rohan. So uh, Anirudh, one thing is in uh, international politics, there's nothing which you can uh, take away from the angle of power, right? It is definitely the why this is happening now because Chinese companies are getting bigger and uh, sometimes better than many other companies. So it is scaring many other uh, countries into action, right? So that there's definitely one angle in that. And the whole idea backdrop to this is that one major angle of power of a nation state going ahead will be its technological supremacy or its ability to harness technologies for various kinds of goals, right? And that's why I guess uh, it is uh, uh, many countries have been sprung into action because what China has done and it has done reasonably well on a lot of technologies and emerging technologies, right? So that is one angle. But at the same time, let us not be under any doubt that uh, China and US are on equal footing when it comes to uh, protection of citizen rights or anything. I, I mean, uh, you've looked at how social credit systems have been operating in China. We've looked at how there is now backlash within China uh, on the usage of uh, face cameras and how they have been tracking uh, activities of citizens. So all those things exist. Secondly, on Huawei's point, which Rohan mentioned, there is very little separation between the state and these companies. Uh, that's pr much more so in China than in many other countries. So that's why uh, these companies, if they do something wrong, they will do something wrong even in the US, even in India, maybe even in U Europe as well. But these will... Uh, we depend on our law and security agencies to bring those to the public domain, on our uh, judiciary to bring those out and uh, to protect uh, individual rights. But that is not the same which will happen in China. So there is clearly a difference, but there is also uh, the angle of power which is having a role to play in this calculation. Okay, fair enough. So to try and summarize this from the Indian perspective, right? Um, India needs um, it needs high-tech stuff in order to grow its economy. It needs to have cheaper consumer electronics. It needs to have better connectivity through 5G or whatever. Um, and the question is really, how do we ensure that India has that available? One option is to go for China. If you, if you were to go for China, then there's always the risk that Huawei is going to do something dangerous with our citizens' data um, and that we would have no recourse if that were to happen. Um, alternatively, we could try to go with Western companies, um, which even though they might certainly be collecting information in a lot of unethical ways, will at least be under a kind of a legal system that India can still work with um, and with governments that India can still work with to kind of uh, seek redress if the worst should happen. Um, I, I assume that's, uh, that summarizes your arguments correctly? Yeah, I would just add that it's not... Uh just about access to these technologies, it is about co-development as well. A lot of these things are in progress, like standards are being uh, defined about how uh, AI can be used. People are thinking about standards uh, for a bunch of these emerging technologies, right? So it is uh, important for India to also be in a formation where it can mold these standards to the benefit of Indians, right? Uh, so mm. that role is also important. And it's not just that India is a taker here. India is also a giver, right? In terms of human capital, in terms of people who can uh, 
create these standards, contribute to the research and development. So I think the agenda is uh, more is broader and it is more significant than just getting access to technology A or technology B. Hmm, fair enough. So, and I think that really is is the meat of the op-ed that you guys have written, right? The question of um, how India can actually co-develop some of these technologies. Um, so let's get it. Let's, let's let's get into the details of how you guys think this could potentially work. You pointed out that when it comes to the COD, when it comes to US, Japan, Australia, and India, there are a lot of complementarities in the technology space, and that potentially working together can help all of these countries achieve better outcomes. So let's let's go through them one by one. First, the U.S. What does the U.S. bring to the table um, in terms of a potential co-development sort of deal? Anirudh, even if even before we go into that, I just wanted to bring this point: why quad? Right? I think that is one important thing to discuss. Given that sure. there are so many of these formations, why don't we tag along with one of these formations and then just uh, go on those lines? Right? So, what the point that we are making is. Even amongst democracies, there are very divergent views on what technology governance, technology policy should look like, right? I mean, just take the example of privacy, for example. What the EU's understanding of privacy is very different from what the US understands it or what India understands it, right? So, for example, you have EU, which takes a very regulation-heavy approach, and it is centered on protecting users' data. US is uh, traditionally preferred a less restrictive approach, which allows technology companies to gain scale. And here in India, we have lots of debates about uh, data localization and trying to attract foreign companies, even while we also want to build our own national champions, right? So you clearly see, even amongst democracies, there is a huge array of possibilities on these issues itself. So the point that we are trying to make is that given that you have so many divergent approaches, if you start grounds up with a new formation, you are going to have a really tough time to come on to agreement with even these fundamental issues, right? How do you govern right. competition in digital economy, technology governance, etc., etc., right? How do you govern Amazon and platforms, all, all that. So our point is that not to get uh, muddled up in these the better approach for India would be to use an existing uh, politico-military arrangement to actually b- plug in technology as one of the extra things that that arrangement does, right? So in that sense, we were thinking that Quad is a good nucleus of uh, com- uh, of countries to start off with. It doesn't mean that it has to be just the Quad countries. But given that Quad countries have a very specific goal in mind, right? The reason why Quad has finally come to fruition in whatever way it has now is because they the goal is clear that uh, China's dangers that it poses in the Indo-Pacific need to be resisted. So that goal is pretty much clear. And once you have that goal clear in a multilateral arrangement, negotiations on the finer issues of what uh, should we do on digital economy, which country should give up and which country should gain, all those reciprocal arrangements work much better if you have a final end goal in mind. And that's why we thought Quad is a good starting point and it can involve many more countries going ahead head as well. So that's what a caveat that I wanted to add. Uh, Rohan, why don't you start with what are the advantages that US has? Yeah, um, plus one to everything Pranay said in general. And um, so so the thing with the US is that it's actually a pretty big powerhouse when it comes to designing semiconductors. Um, For example, let's talk about the software that's used to design semiconductors. These these are very specialized um, pieces of software called EDA tools. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Pranay, but I think this electronic design automation tools, I, I think I got that right. And um, and the major, com- it's a very concentrated space. And the major companies in that space are American. Uh, so there's Cadence Systems, there's Mentor, and uh, there's one more whose name I forget. So one of them was bought by Germany, but it's still based in the US. The other two are still American. And so it's it's quite a, a sort of dominant position that the US is in in semiconductor designing, right? And a a lot of semiconductor uh, semiconductor design also just happens in the US. And so you might have contract manufacturers like TSMC uh, or Samsung, but the designs that are sent to these manufacturers originate in the US. And so that's a pretty strong position uh, in the value chain to be in. 
So, so that, that's the comparative advantage America has. And that's why it's a pretty valuable member in the court to, to focus yeah. on this. So I think one of the arguments that you guys are making in, in your op-ed is also that India does pretty well as far as semiconductor design uh, goes, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, before that, uh, uh, Anirudh, one more point that I wanted to make is that we just discussed semiconductors as a starting point even within the quad for a couple of reasons. Okay. So again, like uh, instead of trying to debate about digital economy, competition, privacy, why not start small about one particular issue and then grow the collaboration from there? That was our point. And semiconductors, why? Because uh, semiconductors uh, sort of underlie all critical technologies, you know, whether you have advancements in computing or artificial intelligence, 5G or space technology, whatever, you will need uh, rapid improvements in semiconductor technology uh, to make such devices faster and cheaper. So that will still remain uh, uh, as we go ahead, right? And second, semiconductors are the most globalized high value supply chain. Uh, There are very few, uh, like Rohan mentioned, there are just two or three companies in each stage of the semiconductor supply chain, which can act as bottlenecks. All right. So there is no one country which can be completely self-sufficient in semiconductors. And as China is finding out, it's quite difficult. So the industry spread all across the world. So even if US is in the dominant position here, it's not as if US can do everything in semiconductors. Even today, most of US semiconductor manufacturing is actually shifted into Thailand. One, for example. So uh, the idea is that this is a good sector to collaborate. It, four countries can do what one country, even if it is the most powerful country in the world, can't do on its own. And that's why we thought this is a good starting point. Okay, fair enough. I kind of see the there's, there's almost like a concordance in terms of the principle that you used to, to argue for the quad, saying that, okay, you know, there's this limited security thing that we all agree on. So let's use that to build out something greater. And similarly, um, there's this limited thing, namely semiconductor design and manufacturing um, that all of us have complementary strengths on. So let's tack that onto the agreement and kind of grow it from there, right? Right. Absolutely. So um, let's just come back to the thread that that we were on originally then. So what about India? What does India bring to the table in all of this? Yeah, so uh, India is uh, really... uh, So let's divide the semiconductor supply chain into a few stages, right? So first you have the R&D and design stage, then you have a manufacturing stage, and then finally you have uh, the assembly and testing phase, and you also distribute semiconductors to the final original equipment manufacturers. So you have these some uh, four or five stages that you can think of. Now, uh, Rohan already mentioned that uh, four out of the top 10 fabulous companies, that, that that is companies which just do exclusively the design, are American. And even the software, which are very specialized software, which is used to do this design, is also owned by um, American companies, right? So that is one section. Now, coming to India, this design stage is also a very human capital intensive stage. Basically, you just need a large number of well-qualified engineers in electronics, in material sciences, etc. to participate in this stage, right? Uh, So that's where India has an advantage. And we had some stats like, for example, the IESA, which is the Indian Electronic Semiconductor Association, had done a survey and they said that nearly 3,000 chips are designed in India every year. And in fact, most of the top foreign semiconductor companies have their R&D or design centers in India. So you have, whether it is Qualcomm, whether it is Texas Instruments, Intel, Samsung, all these companies do have some base in India with a large number of engineers skilled enough to do R&D and specially design of semiconductors. So that's where we think there is definitely an advantage. Now coming to the last stage, which would be finally distribution and then putting those semiconductors onto printed circuit boards, assembly, and then, you know, uh, assembling it into a final product like a phone. There again, it's a la- very labor intensive sector and you would require large number of uh, people who can... Uh, 
on an assembly line who can do this work right now here again india is not the best in the world definitely but india has made some beginnings so you have foxconn which recently announced its intent to invest in india you also have samsung uh, building its uh, largest mobile phone manufacturing plant uh, so those things are also where india has a sort of uh, advantage so anything related to human capital is something that india can take advantage of hmm. okay so that's interesting i i remember that um, in in our tanks club which is our we, which is our weekly uh, meeting that happens every thursday um rohan talked a little bit about um where the human capital that is designing uh, all these chips in the us is coming from um and one thing that really stuck with me was the fact that a huge number of them are actually indian graduates uh, so you have people who done their bachelors in india uh, and who are going to the us to get their masters or phd and then um end up in uh, working in these major like semiconductor uh, chip design firms which brings me to another question right so clearly india is doing something right if there are so many kind of design companies in india but the fact that so many indian graduates are going to the usa in order to get the quality qualification and end up getting a job it seems to point to something that india isn't doing that well and that is namely actually educating this enormous pool of human capital that we have so how do you guys think that bridge that that gap can be bridged um do you think that it's something that potential collaboration with the us could look at in terms of like improving india's human capital as well so india can grow as uh, a semiconductor designer that's a good question uh, anirudh but we have to understand why uh, human capital or people engineers are going to the us instead of india i think the reason for that is more structural the fact that we have uh, an ecosystem which exists in the us uh, uh, for semiconductors and it doesn't exist in india for a variety of reasons right some of them are just the fact that we are not able to uh, uh, Give, not able to build big businesses uh, there are labor issues there are contractual issues legal issues so those are a broader set of issues that need to be fixed uh, also the demand side right you also need in a semiconductor ecosystem finally to be able to produce uh, products uh, original equipment manufacturer should be in the c- same country but we don't have that as of now so given those constraints it is fine if there are a lot of indians who are going to the us and they are leading uh, providers for human capital in the us semiconductor industry so i think the advantage again is as we said that no one country can build this semiconductor industry on its own so if we have these arrangements the advantage is that us india japan and australia will be able to take advantage of all of their uh, uh, different uh, strengths and come together Yeah I think that's a pretty pretty good point Pranay one thing I would like to add here is um, and sorry about the humble plug guys but in in the newsletter that I started uh, today which called hand me the paper I talk about the paper uh, in in tanks club and the industry in the US has pretty strong network effects which mean that uh, which means that if if you are in a particular ecosystem in the semiconductor industry you're likely to stay there and it's very hard to make sure that human capital from that goes from india to the us can come come back from us to india and as you will see in, in, i think we can link the paper in the show notes but most of the people who are moving from india to the us are moving for a masters degree or a phd and with the explicit goal of staying there so i i i don't think reversing that is going to be an easy uh, phenomena uh, but i'm not an expert in migration policy Um, so maybe we can refer that to someone else who is and b- one thing that i also would like to talk about here is is japan which is another member of the quad which is pretty useful when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing equipment and there are three elements that i wanted to discuss um, pranay you please uh, add whatever whenever you think it's uh, right but um, the three things that japan does really well at is um, man- manufacturing and shipping silicon wafers um, the second thing that is manufacturing photo resist and finally uh, man- manufacturing etching gas so uh, etching gas basically is the gas that's used to uh, remove unwanted stuff from the chip um, it, it's a pretty crucial step in the manufacturing process uh, wafers uh, of course are, are foundational to sort of just what the chip should be made on and so wafers are of course uh, how do you say this indisposable and of course the photo resists are uh, are useful in the etching process as well so uh, and these are these are areas where japan has been pretty dominant it's been uh, dominant because it's it's 
it's told South Korea that it's not going to ship etching gas. I think that happened uh, a few years ago, and South Korea basically had to come up with its own industry. And so, a pretty pretty useful advantage to have there in the quad. So, I, I would just like to add on that is uh, see the semiconductor manufacturing is. Uh, a very uh, high precision game, right? We are talking about five nanometers, right? So uh, uh, that at that particular uh, dimension, even a dust particle can actually just destroy your circuitry. So you need very high precision, clean environments uh, and all that. And true to their reputation, uh, Japanese companies excel in doing this. And just a few Japanese companies, you know, run this part of the semiconductor uh, industry, right? So there are just three or four companies which are supplying etching gas to the world, uh, just three or four companies which are leading in terms of photo resists and all that, right? So that's why Japan also has a very distinct advantage uh, with respect to semiconductor manufacturing uh, within the quad. So that's an advantage. Uh, let's come to Australia then. Uh, Rohan, what do you think about Australia's strengths? I think the biggest strength that Australia has in uh, semiconductor, the value chain, is processing raw materials. So... Um, Semiconductors use a bunch of rare earths to be made possible. And generally, what we see here, uh, and I think there's a paper that Pandey and I have been working on, and during the research, we found that a lot of uh, the rare earths uh, and materials that are used to manufacture the semiconductors are, are concentrated in a few parts of the world. For example, phosphorus is concentrated in Morocco and so on and so forth. But uh, companies that process uh, these um, these materials are either in China, which is which is a pretty big player in the in, in the processing department. But the the only player that's outside of China and is doing well in the space is Australia. And I think they've got a they've got they've got a company whose name I'm sure to butcher, but I'm just gonna give it a shot anyway. Lie Lie Hands Corporation. Um, Linus. There you go. <laughs> so uh, and and so they're the second uh, they're the biggest manufacturer, the, the producer of rare earth materials outside of China. And I think that's pretty significant because uh, not a lot of countries actually have this strength. And I think that's going to be a pretty significant uh, value add to the quad. Yeah, so uh, just to mention that phosphorus, uh, etc. are used in, uh, if you have uh, processes for uh, doping of semiconductors, and <clears throat> these are not rare earths per se, uh, but uh, the, Australia has... Uh, a mining industry which provides these materials. Secondly, what I think uh, the more significant advantage of Australia is that it, it will play an increasing role in the original equipments, uh, finally, where the semiconductors actually go. For example, uh, you will have semiconductors in uh, electric vehicles. But for running an electric vehicle, finally, you will also need electromagnets. And those electromagnets are actually need neodymium and neodymium is again, uh, Australia is the largest supplier. So uh, finally, when we go to a new tech economy where there will be lots of electric vehicles, uh, etc., you will need uh, some of these materials, uh, the rare earth especially, and Australia has proven excellence in that particular aspect. So that's where Australia's role comes in. Um, and I think to wrap up, Pranay, I think when we started writing this article, you, you said that all of these countries have their own comparative advantage, but we also have to look at comparative disadvantage. And um, and the way I look at it is that the US doesn't do, uh, or, or Australia doesn't doesn't do well when it comes to the labor front, but they do well on, on the rare earth processing and, and design front. Whereas India can sort of make up for that labor front by, by having a more OSAT factories and... Uh, and more assembly plants. And and Japan, for example, may not do so well on that front, but they do well on, on producing SME, semiconductor manufacturing equipment stuff. So I, I feel like that's a pretty important point because it's basically this set of countries that, that does really well to complement each other's comparative disadvantages as well. And this is sort of also what makes the core pretty ideal for pursuing a strategy such as this. Right. The key point is also that one missing element in all this is that, of course, uh, none of these uh, countries actually house a below 5 nanometer manufacturing plant. So though that's where all the cutting edge uh, semiconductor uh, products are coming out. So, for example, your latest iPhones will have 
uh, will uh, start having five nanometer uh, and below processor chips designed at that level. So with none of the comp- companies in these countries have uh, such a fab. Only TSMC and Samsung uh, in Taiwan and South Korea respectively are the players remaining here. So I guess one very important thing the quad countries can get together and to demonstrate that they are serious about technology collaboration in general is to start a consortium to fund such a semiconductor fab. You know, So already we see TSMC's 5 nanometer plant which was which is going to start in Arizona it costs around uh, 12 billion dollars so that's quite a, a significant upfront capital investment and it would be really big investment for a country like India or even Japan and Australia to do on their own but if they do this together uh, i think there is a lot of scope so that's one really important point uh, that the four countries can get together on uh, moreover we, one thing we also discussed is that these are just potentials that the four countries has but to actually really convert it into uh, ground level action uh, there needs to be a lot more things done on the trade front as well for example uh, when we were talking about human capital if there is encourage uh, there is all the four countries encourage the movement of skilled professionals in the semiconductor industry between these four countries or they build confidence in each other's judicial settlement mechanisms they think of developing common standards uh, or even the most important part, part is allowing knowledge transfer on sophisticated technology issues right you don't want countries uh, blocking access uh, to you know r and d facilities say a company wants to a us company wants to build a facility in india and the government blocks it saying that this is critical technology and we don't want it to go outside our own uh, borders so if those are some of the constraints uh, between these four countries if uh, they agree that knowledge transfer should be easy and there will be freer movement of professionals in these four countries then the uh, progress of the semiconductor industry can be fastened and that will be really useful so our colleague uh, nitin pai has called these building bubbles of trust basically building these bubbles of trust between important countries which think on similar lines and if these bubbles are handled carefully and quickly then we can make a lot of progress on this front right so this is uh, another thing that needs to fall in place to convert the potential into uh, ground level action um yeah i i think that's a pretty great idea pranay and um, i think we've uh... The, the bubbles of trust thing is really interesting because it, it's as Nitin mentions in it in his op-ed, it's going to be hard to manage these bubbles, and I think we also began our op-ed saying that it's uh, there is some dissonance in strategies of different countries and how they tackle tech. So um, it's going to be an interesting space for sure going forward, and and time will tell how it develops. All right, um, thank you guys so much. This was a very interesting conversation. It was. Um, uh, an interesting peek behind the hood of the complexities uh, that go into uh, manufacturing so many of our everyday consumer electronics and um, I think there's a lot of interesting points there uh, that India can potentially take away um, and I can see that there are a lot of things that India could benefit from doing if it were to in- indulge in a broader quad uh, technology co-development sort of regime. On that note, I would really recommend all of our listeners um, to check out Pranay and Rohan's op-ed in hindustan times you should find a link in the description um and also subscribe to rohan's newsletter and thank you both for joining me and thank you all for listening to all things policy please consider signing up for takshashila's courses applications are now open and you can apply at www.takshashila.org.in slash courses if you liked our show Don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST. or our website takshashila.org.in
I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Once again, just a quick reminder, please do help us out by filling out our survey. It's at ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It really does help us figure out who's listening and, you know, what are the characteristics that we can go and push to advertisers. That is massively helpful to us. Please, please, please do help out with that. So, on the network this week, let me start with a quick milestone. It's the 100th episode of Begin the Journey with Ashish Vidyarthi. Congratulations to Ashish and the team. Great show. If you're not listening to it, he talks to you about just how to approach life. It's just very, very cool stuff. Do check this out. Want to mention the note with Maru Kinaya. She talks about why petrol prices are so high. On The Wire Talk, Siddharth speaks with Harsh Mandar. On Advertising is Dead, Varun speaks to Kabir Biswas, the founder of Dunzo. They have a really interesting conversation about, you know, what's the future of Dunzo and what they're thinking about. On The Traveling Professor's Diaries, check out Siddharth talk about the performance paradox. I found it really fascinating and interesting. I think that you guys will really get something out of listening to that. Please do give that a listen. And finally, let me mention Zindagi Diaries. It's Ragini Kumar's poetry podcast. The first week when it came out, we put out five poems first week. We put out another five poems this week. And the response has been phenomenal. Do check it out. It's in Hindi. It's a poetry podcast. Something a little different. Do give it a shot and let us know what you think. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun, and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IBM app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts.